So have you ever had that situation where you thought you had a friend and then it turned out that when the chips were down, they weren't there for you? I, uh, I had a friend in grade five and grade six. My best friend was a guy named Chris. And Chris and I spent all our time together. Both of our parents worked at the same school, the boarding school that we grew up at. And so during the summers, we would go in to work with them. And there were just forests on two sides of the school. And we would go exploring and running through. And um, it was a great time. Anyways, one day, Chris and I, we, we were going back, we were following this old road that turned into a dirt road, which turned into just a path. And as we got back to the dirt road part, we noticed that there was a pickup truck on the side of the road there. We didn't think too much of it, thought it was a little bit odd, but we kept walking on. So, so we're walking along and going further and further back away from the school. And all of a sudden, we, we came into this clearing and there was a guy walking two very large Rottweilers. And we saw them and we froze. And we'd been, you know, told that if you meet a new dog and you're not sure about it, stand still and hold out your hand and it will sniff you. But in that moment of fear, we didn't even think about anything. It was just blind panic reaction. We saw those dogs and they were scary. And so we ran. So we turned around and we just started bolting and running. And as soon as we started running, the dogs came after us. So there we are, running down this road for all our little legs could carry us. And we look back and these giant monster Rottweilers are coming, woof, 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 after us. And we're like, they are going to catch us and eat us and we are going to die. And we tried to outrun them, but they had four legs and we only had two and they were just as big as we were. So they were gaining on us. And we knew that there was no escape from running. So this is when my friend Chris came up with the plan. He said to me, Brian, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm going to run to the right and you run to the left. Maybe both dogs will chase one person. If the dogs chase me, tell my mom I loved her. <laughs> and I said, okay, if the dogs chase me, tell my mom I loved her too. And so he counted, ready? One, two, and then on three, he grabbed me, threw me on the ground. For all he was worth. And as I lay there watching my best friend leaving me to die, the Rottweilers pounced on top of me and started messily drooling and licking on me because they were two actually very friendly puppies who just wanted to play. But I knew, I knew in that moment that my so-called friend was not actually going to be there for me when I needed him. And that was the situation that we find Jesus and Peter in as we come into our story today. Now, Peter is really interesting as we look through the Bible. His story is so diverse. There is a lot of good, but there's a lot of bad. You know, Peter is the one that when Jesus was walking on water, got out of the boat and walked towards him. And now people tend to focus on the fact that he then doubted and started sinking in. He got out of the boat. That's more than I do. <laughs> he was the first of the disciples to declare that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the first one to, to always put himself out there, sometimes in really bad ways. Peter had this thing where whatever popped into his head, he just blurted out what just came out of his mouth. I sympathize with Peter a lot in this. When, when Jesus is revealed at the transfiguration, and there's this holy moment where it's like, oh, he really is God, and oh, Moses and Elijah are showing up too. What does Peter start doing? Hey, we should build some houses here. This is so cool. And everyone's like, what? 
What are you talking about? Because he just like comes into his head. It comes out his mouth. Sometimes he would make these bold pronouncements when Jesus said that he was going to be betrayed. Peter was the first one to say, no, not me. I would never do that. Surely others will betray. I will never do that. And Jesus is just like, yeah, you're going to betray me three times before the night's over. When they come to arrest Jesus, even though Jesus has said this has to happen, Peter is the one who loses his temper, grabs a knife, and starts swinging at people. Ends up cutting the ear, doesn't even get one of the soldiers, cuts a servant's ear off. And Jesus has to stop everything, heal the servant, and say, look, if I wanted to use force, I could call angels to defend myself. Peter doesn't get it. But then... When Jesus is taken away, he's on trial. It's clear that he's going to actually be, he's going to be killed. Peter falls apart. Despite his brags, despite how he said he was going to be there for good, people start asking Peter, hey, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? And he's like, oh, I don't, who, who Jesus? I, I don't know any Jesus. Who are you talking about? Another person asks him, no, no, no. The third person asks him, he gets so angry, he starts swearing and cursing and saying, I don't even know who this Jesus is. Peter was not a ride or die friend. And in that moment, he denies he even knows Jesus at all. And Jesus turns and looks at him and he knows, I failed. Now these stories... They're hard stories, but in some ways they give me comfort. Because if I was going to write a book about uh, Jesus and his followers, and the disciples were the ones who were telling these stories, if they were making things up, they would try and make it look good. It's kind of like when you're putting together your Facebook profile, you find that one really good picture from 10 years ago with just the right light, and say, yes, this is me, and ignore all of the other kind of not-so-flattering photos that have happened since, or maybe that's just me. But we, we tend to want to put ourselves in a good light. But the gospel accounts, they're, they're messy. They are, they include all of the mistakes, everything they got wrong. They were just, every time the disciples are talked about, they're pretty much messing things up. It does not have the tone of something that was made up to make themselves look good. So Peter, in all of his impulsiveness and messiness, ends up denying Jesus. But then we get to the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is the second part. It's the second book written by the same person as Luke. And yet when we see Peter and the disciples in this thing, they have completely changed. So to give you some context as we're looking at Acts 5, the disciples have been going around. They've received the Holy Spirit. They've been filled with power. They're doing miraculous things. They're speaking in languages they don't even know so that other people can understand them. They're going around telling everyone about Jesus. And the same people who killed Jesus are not happy about this. So they grab them and they throw them in jail. While they're in jail overnight, an angel shows up, opens the door, and they all go free. In the morning, the Pharisees are having a meeting about what to do about the disciples who are in jail. And then they realize, someone comes in, he's like, so the people you're talking about, they're in the temple yard right now preaching again. They're like, we just put you in jail, what's going on? So they go and arrest them again and bring them up in front of them. And as they're standing there, it says this, bringing them back, they stood them before the high council and the chief priest said, didn't we give you strict orders not to teach in Jesus' name? And here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are trying your best to blame us for the death of his ma- of this man. Now, to be clear here, the us here is the religious leaders. Sometimes people have used 
theology of this to say all Jewish people, and that has twisted into things which led to actually a shooting not too long ago in a synagogue. So we're clear. He's talking about the the Jewish leaders at the time, but also he's talking about all of the people, humanity as a whole, who were part of rejecting Jesus. Peter and the apostles answered, it is necessary to obey God rather than men. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, the one you killed by hanging him on a cross. God set him on high at his side, prince and savior, to give Israel the gift of a changed life and sins forgiven. And we are witnesses to these things. The Holy Spirit, whom God gives to those who obey him, corroborates every detail. When they heard that, they were furious and wanted to kill them on the spot. But one of the council members stood up, a Pharisee by the name of Galamiel, a teacher of God's law who was honored by everyone. He ordered the men taken out of the room for a short time, then said, Fellow Israelites, be careful what you do to these men. Not long ago, Thetis made something of a splash claiming to be someone and got 400 men to join him. He was killed, his followers dispersed, and nothing came of it. A little later, at a time of the census, Judas the Galilean appeared and acquired a following. He also fizzled out, and the people following him were scattered to the four winds. So I am telling you, hands off these men. Let them alone. If this program is or this work is merely human, it will fall apart. But if it is of God, there is nothing you can do about it. And you better not be found fighting against God. That convinced them. They called the apostles back in. After giving them a thorough whipping, they warned them not to speak in Jesus' name and sent them off. The apostles went out of the high council overjoyed because they had been given the honor of being dishonored on account of the name. Every day they were in the temple and homes teaching and preaching Christ Jesus, not letting up for a minute. This is a huge transformation. They go from running away, falling asleep, denying Jesus, to even when they're arrested, when they're beaten, standing up and saying, we have to continue to say that this is true. We have to continue to say that God is doing that. And even when they were beaten, they were rejoicing. They weren't looking at it as, oh man, this is really horrible that this happened. They, they had hope even amongst persecution to say, God trusts us enough that we get to testify even when we're getting beat for it. What a change of mindset. How can these be the same people who only a month or two before were running away and denying Jesus? This is the transformation. This is the change that the Holy Spirit can bring in the lives of believers. And the transformation of the disciples is to me one of the strongest evidences we have in the truth of the resurrection. Understand that Jesus was not the first person who showed up, claimed to be the Messiah, and got killed. There had been dozens of them who had happened in the years before Jesus. Two of them were recorded in this scripture passage that we had there. And all of them, the same thing happened. The person came, claimed to be the Messiah. They got killed. They stayed dead. All of their followers scattered and ran away. Because while they believed while they were alive, after their death, they gave up. Some of them, they made shrines of their tombs, but no one ran around saying, no, he's still alive. But the disciples were convinced that the resurrection happened. And they were so convinced that they continued to hold up saying, we have seen Jesus alive, even when they were thrown in jail, even when they were beaten, even when they were killed. 11 of the 12 disciples died martyrs' death, and they all went to their death proclaiming that Jesus was alive. This makes no sense 
except that they genuinely believed it and were willing to die for that truth. The resurrection was not theoretical, it was real in their lives. And as that resurrection was seen, as the Holy Spirit empowered them, their lives changed. How did their lives change? There was a couple things. Number one, they were excited to share their faith. They could not stop talking about Jesus. Number two, there was a deep desire for prayer. They were gathering on a regular basis to pray. There was a sense of unity as they came together, where they all were on the same page and saying, we're moving forward together in this. There was increased generosity where people were selling their land and giving it to the disciples so that everyone would have something and no one would be in need. They were able to speak without fear and even in front of people who had the power of life and death over them. And these were the same people who were running away and denying They had joy even when they were persecuted. Even when things were hard, there was something in them that let them rejoice. And that, I think, only can come from the Holy Spirit. And finally, they had focus in their calling. The one passage it talks about, as they were gathering together, they were realizing that there were people in need and all of their needs weren't being met. And it was a huge job taking care of them all. And the disciples who knew that that was part of God's work also knew that if they tried to do that, then they couldn't do what they were called to do in the preaching and teaching. So they went out and they found other people and laid hands on them and said, we're giving this job to you. And those people who had been given gifts by the Holy Spirit used those gifts to meet those needs. They realized they could not do everything. So they said, what is the thing that God is calling me to do right now? But they also believed that God was big enough and his gifts were great enough. They didn't have to do it all themselves because God had given his gifts on everyone. And so they found those people and blessed them and sent them out. Now, if these signs of transformation sound a little bit uh, familiar to you, there's a reason for it. Because we talk a lot about something called our bullseye, the markers of a Christian life here. Using spiritual practices, prayer and reading scripture, serving others, worshiping together, giving generously, authentic community, sharing Christ. These are the same, the markers of transformation are these same markers that we're looking at in our own church and saying, people that are following Jesus, when he changed their lives, these are the things that are happening. So this is not just a transformation that happened 2,000 years ago for some people back then. This is something that is continuing to transform people today. One of my favorite parts of Tuesday staff meeting is when we get together and we have a time where everyone shares stories of where we've seen God making a difference in our church. And every week, we don't have to sit there waiting. There's always, oh, I have a story, I have a story. It gets to the point where our meetings run long because we're just, oh, just one more story because God is doing things in our church. And it's exciting. I love to see how God is working in our communities and our families in Brampton and beyond. God wants to bring transformation in your life and in our church. And he has sent his spirit to empower that. Now, as I tell you this, some of you I know are sitting here and you've got a little voice in the back of your head. And that voice is going... I don't see any transformation in my life right now. What's wrong with me? Why is everybody else getting transformed but not me? Maybe this isn't real or maybe I'm not real. Maybe, And I know that because I have that voice in the back of my head too. And it constantly accuses me and says, oh, you're not good enough. You're not strong. There's, you know. And I have been through seasons in my life where I struggled to see transformation. So what do you do if you're not feeling the passion in your faith? What do you do if you're not seeing this transformation going on? Well, a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, remember, this is not 
a competition. And there is no comparison. A couple years ago, I received probably one of the highest honors of my career. I was named one of the 35 Christian leaders under the age of 35 in Canada. And it was really exciting. They flew us all out to this conference on an island across from Vancouver. And they did all of this training for us. And we got written up in magazines. And and my ego went about like this through the whole thing. But I remember walking around at that conference, meeting all of the other young leaders, and feeling in the back of my head that I was an imposter. Like someone had made a mistake and my name got kind of mixed in with the group and I didn't actually belong there. Everyone else seemed smarter. Everyone else seemed cooler. Everyone else had larger ministries or were doing more stuff or had gifts that I didn't have. And I just, this voice in the back of my head the whole time was saying, you don't belong here. You don't belong here. And so the last day we had a prayer meeting going on and it was a prayer concert for Canada and we were praying for two whole hours for Canada. And I prayed for about half an hour and ran out of things to pray for. I got really distracted. I was like looking all over the place and I kept being like, no, come on, this is really important. We have to focus on prayer here. But I, I, I'm not, this is not one of my great gifts. And so I would pray for a bit and I'd get distracted. And then I looked over and I saw there was another youth pastor who was at a bigger church who I really admired. And he was face down on the ground, just shaking as he prayed. And I thought, wow, look at him. Look how passionate he is right now. He loves Jesus so much. Why can't I be like him? And I actually got up and I left. And I went down and sat on a dock and I was crying to myself as I was praying and saying, God, why, why can't I be like these other people? I don't really belong here. My one friend saw me out there and he came out and he prayed for me and he said, Brian, you have gifts that they don't. You have a calling that they don't. Don't compare yourself to him. God, it's not a mistake that you're here. And so we went together and we were walking back up And as we walking back up, I saw this youth pastor and two other youth pastors. It's always the youth pastors for some reason. And they were actually in the room below where the prayer concert was going on and they were playing pool. And I'm like, what is going on? So I went in and I'm like, what are you doing down here? They're like, we got kicked out. I'm like, what do you mean they got kicked out? They were like, well, we were trying to pray, but we got distracted. So then we started telling jokes to each other, trying to make the other people laugh out loud. And they were actually really crude jokes. And then I was laughing so hard that I collapsed on the ground and started shaking at the jokes. And then someone asked me to leave. So when I was looking at him going, why can't I be as holy as him? He was laughing at crude jokes that he was telling to the other youth pastors. So it's not a comparison. It's not a competition. Some people are naturally emotive. Some people are not. I am one of those emotive people. I went and saw Avengers Endgame this week. I cried seven times during the movie. People around me were like, what is wrong with you? Pull it together. But that's just me. I cry in every movie. It just... It it happens. And there are other people. I I worked at a German church and for several years and I would preach and everyone sat in the audience and scowled the entire time. And I thought they all hate what I'm saying. No, they had deep emotions. It's just not the German way to show them. So it's, it's, it's not a comparison. It's not a competition. However God wired you is okay. And stop comparing yourself to other people. Number two, variance of feelings is normal to be expected. You know this in relationships. There are times, you know, I have friends that have just had children and they're like, the child has popped out and they're like, I will give my entire existence to this being. It is the most beautiful and wonderful thing in the world. And I can think of nothing more than to spend every living second just staring at how wonderful they are. 
And then I have another friend whose child is three and four right now and says, please take these children away from me. <laughs> in the same way, you will have variance in your feelings of connection to God, and that is normal and okay. If you are feeling a lack of passion right now, pray. Pray, God, I want to experience you more. I want to be closer to you. Please show more of yourself to me. Make space and time for God in your life. So often I say, God, I want more of you in my life. Oh, I've got the next meeting I've got to run off to. And it's only when I clear time in my life to hear from God that I reconnect to things. And it happens so suddenly, I don't even notice it. Final thing is this, rest in God's love and goodness. Understand that God loves you even when you're not feeling things. That his love is not tied to how good you are. His love is not tied to what you have done. His love is not tied to whether you feel it right now or not. His love is. So rest in that. I know you don't have to perform. We're going to gather now together as a family at the communion table. It's our way of remembering God's love for us and participating in it together. It's not something that you have to be good enough, that you have to have had everything taken care of in your life. You can come to the table with a life as messy as the disciples and know that God is here to show his love to you. Let us pray. Loving God, as we come to this table, may we remember that your love has already said yes to us. That you know everything we have done wrong, are doing wrong, and will ever do wrong, and you choose love. May we remember together how good and deep and wonderful that love is. And may the reality of that love empower us to have passionate transformation in our life to seek to share that love with everyone we know. Amen.